This is Peter Layden, take one. Uh, I've got a professional here. Ready, Dave? Yep. What do you mean that our war, covering war, was a lot of fun? Well, it was exciting. Um, obviously, it wasn't fun for the, uh, the people on the receiving end, but it was fun for us in that there was uh, there was a camaraderie that you uh, you don't have when you uh, when you're walking under working under normal conditions. Excuse me, can I hold this for a second? Oh, hang on, that right. Peter Layden, take two. What do you mean by war was a lot of fun? Um, well, it was fun for us. It obviously wasn't fun for the people on the other end. The GIs, the refugees, and so on. So, without sounding flippant, it was fun for us because there was there was a camaraderie amongst us. It was exciting for us. Uh, and many of us were a generation that that grew up during a war and and hadn't experienced a war. So. Peter Layden, take three. What was your impression of the American and Australian forces in Vietnam, the military? Well, the military were military. Um, they were professionals, those that left, that, that lived long enough. I'm sorry, I'll, I'll start that again. Well, the military were, were military. Uh, they were professionals, uh, most of them. Those that lived long or longer than a month or so were were fast professionals. You said before on the tape that they were bungling idiots. No, no, I didn't say that, no. David. No. Um, I had well, you had to have a certain amount of respect for the military. They were there doing whatever they were doing. You didn't necessarily agree with with uh, with the military involvement in in Vietnam, but you you had to live with them. Uh, you had to respect the fact that they were. They were wandering all over the boondocks, uh, getting themselves killed. So you couldn't be uh, you couldn't be too faced about the situation. They were keeping you alive uh, while you were doing your job. What was your position in Australia before you went into the war zone? I was working for a commercial television station as as a film cameraman. Were you happy in that job? I was as happy as anyone is was. Mm -hmm. What did your colleagues think about you uh, working where you were, or, or your idea that you were going to go to the war? They thought I was completely bananas. And, and told you so. Oh yes, crazy. Mm -hmm. In terms of your own h home life, uh, did, was it a happy home life? Oh yes, oh yes. I used to come back and see them every Christmas. Uh huh. And uh, before you left, though, where did you live? What, what were you earning? That sort of thing. I was earning a hundred dollars a week, and we were living up. A above a bank in Burwood, if I remember correctly. And so uh, working for the Americans was, was certainly worth a hell of a lot more money, as well as doing all the things that I wanted to do, get involved in a war and see a war and do all that kind of bit that you, you get involved with, that you want to do when you're a little younger. Mm -hmm. Why don't we see, or why didn't we see much Australian footage on television in terms of action and military? Well, the Australians were only uh, looking after one particular province, I gathered, uh, whereas I was working for an American network. And uh, for the time I was there, we were flat out covering th the American GIs getting themselves killed and reporting their, their battles and their incidents. Was there much involvement, though, on the Australians' part? I gather so. They had a whole, whole province of their own to look after. We never got out to see the Australians at all. Mm -hmm. Were you uh, happy about going up in helicopters towards the end? Uh, not towards the end. I started getting a bit hairy towards the end when uh, the Vietnamese started maintaining the helicopters. And For instance? And they weren't doing it terribly well. The, uh, um, well, you'd get to go on a helicopter and you'd see a Vietnamese mechanic fiddling around with a screwdriver and reading the manual upside down. And you'd you'd naturally get a little bit hairy. you get a little bit worried that he didn't know what he's on about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you go on any uh, bombing missions at all? 
Yeah, I flew a couple of times in in prop aircraft on uh, on bombing missions. What was that like? I was terrified. Why? I was just plain scared, for Christ's sake. Yeah. In terms of, was there any real, real thing you scared, being scared, or what made you scared? Well, merely flying around in one of these things and and getting yourself shot at it at the same time. Uh, the uh, my most vivid memory was was flying in a spotter aircraft over over Quezon, which was in the north of the country, and there were there were Vietnamese there were North Vietnamese around Quezon as as thick as the trees, and we were fired on. We must have been fired on by a uh, by a twin gun emplacement because these two explosions went off on our tail. Enormous bang and the and the shatter of shrapnel against the aircraft. And I'll, I'll never forget it. The pilot looked at me, and I looked at the pilot. And I thought to myself, "What the hell does he expect me to do?" You know. And he immediately threw the plane into a great kind of a dive, and we we weaved around and dived up and down. And I thought to myself, "This is for the birds. I'd rather be back on the ground." Was that early in the war, or towards the end of the war? Uh, that was '68ish. Uh, I think uh, you said before that uh, flying in helicopters was one of the reasons why you decided to get out of Vietnam. No, flying in helicopters didn't worry me too much until such times as the Vietnamese started maintaining them. Uh, while the Americans were doing so, you could uh, at least think to yourself that the Americans were maintaining the aircraft for their own guys. Uh, you described for me before an incident where bombers were being landed in Thailand, B-52s. Yeah, uh, I was amongst the first first press team uh, to go to Thailand to to a B-52 base. And here was this enormous aircraft. Well, the whole squadron came back from, from their bombing runs over South and North, over South Vietnam. They weren't bombing North Vietnam at the time, oh, with the exception of the very southern part of North Vietnam. So here was this enormous aircraft that they were, uh, uh, they were loading whole semi-trailer fulls of bombs into and the master sergeant standing around told me that that was just the first part of bombing up. In other words, what they loaded, what, how many semi-trailers onto it? Well, there were two there while I was there and there were, uh, and there were more coming, so there were... Onto one aircraft? Onto a B-52. How big is enormous? About the length of... Uh, have a Boeing 707, a little narrower, but a huge wingspan. The whole thing was, was purely designed to carry this enormous bomb load. It's an incredible amount of uh, tonnage to be dropping on a, a small country. You can say that again, a, an incredible amount of ironmongery to be, to be redecorating the, the Vietnamese landscape, as we used to say. Did you have a chance to talk to any of these bomber pilots and why they did it? We, uh, we, we spoke to some some Navy pilots while we were on a, an aircraft carrier filming strikes against Haiphong and Hanoi. And they were, like all flyers I suppose, uh, completely divorced from what was going on on the ground. They used to explain that they were so busy just, just getting themselves there and operating their aircraft and all their, their instruments and all this kind of stuff, that they used to divorce themselves from what was, what was happening down there. They'd, they never consider the moral obligation or responsibilities or questions. No, no, they used to. Uh, they were too busy to, to, to involve themselves in the moral aspects of the war. But I dare say there were some that that, uh, that used to consider it, and they wouldn't keep flying. I suppose. How would you how would you explain it, though, given the fact that they must know what the damage that it would bring? I think. I suppose the professional military and the flyers that uh, program themselves that way. Whatever happens down there or whatever happens on the other end of the of the artillery barrage is no real concern of theirs they're merely doing what they're what they're programmed to do press this button do that drop those bombs you know fire that missile do that what about the journalists were they programmed to cover the war in a similar fashion um well it was a little different for them they uh, they like ourselves would would get themselves involved and maybe a little bit more I, a uh, film people like myself, maybe could, could uh, divorce themselves from what was going on to the extent that uh, you were merely seeing the war through your viewfinder. And so 
that was your image of the war. That was your image of the of the killing and the devastation and the refugees and all that kind of stuff. So uh, you were you were divorced by your your viewfinder image, if you like. End of tape, Cliff. End of tape. Peter Layden, take four. I'll just put out the cigarette, David. Did you ever feel that you were uh, a voyeur on the other people's suffering, that uh, you didn't really have much to do with what they had to feel and, and think? Uh, I suppose we could be thought of, of being that way, but uh, that's not, not what we were there for. We were being paid to to cover the war and film the war and film the suffering of the refugees and film people getting killed and f film people being being rendered hopeless, uh, homeless, I beg your pardon, and all this kind of nonsense. Did that just make you mercenaries without guns? Should I start that again? Because I, 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 I stumble too much. Ask the question again. Yeah. Were you voyeurs on uh, the sidelines towards other people's pain and suffering? Well, maybe we were. Um, but we were there to do what we were paid to do, which was to film the war and film the suffering and film the dying and film the refugees being, being rendered hopeless, uh, homeless and being killed and all this kind of nonsense. So we were voyeurs. We were, we were uh, complete mercenaries, if you like, uh, being paid to witness this, this kind of suffering. Mm. How do you feel about that? No moral obligation, responsibility as a human being? Well, I've tried explaining to other people that you you couldn't really allow yourself to become involved um, morally, if you like. Otherwise, you'd go bananas. You know, this this whole weight of the of this complete suffering and and killing and maiming and all this kind of business would would completely get you. You you had to restrict yourself to to what you saw in your viewfinder, and you had to busy yourself with. With the, with the technicalities of filming, as, as David is doing there. Does, doesn't this uh, make you just like the bomber pilot, though, in terms that your f sense of objectivity is, is a false uh, shield to hide behind to stop you from presenting the war as it really was and saying, what, we, what are we doing there? Sure, yeah. maybe so. But we were presenting the war as it really was. Every night, the people used to see us as lead story on their on their televisions, this whole absurd war of uh, suffering and killing and maiming. There wasn't a lot of that cut out there by New York editors who decided that they wanted a sanitised version of the war? I understand not. You know, it was played as we filmed it. And here for the first time, and they went ape, you know, here for the first time was, was a living, breathing, full colour war, stereophonic sound and and boy, they just they just played it as it was, and that's what I dare say. You know, we were we were responsible, if you like, for the uh, anti-war feeling, the anti-war movement that that grew and grew in the states because we were presenting the war well, each night. Or did you get caught up in the same cynicism that uh, enabled the New York editor to present that sort of suffering with completely an emotionless state? Maybe so, uh, but we, we merely filmed what was going on. And for the first time again, if you like, here was a war that, uh, that was being presented to the public com in a completely unedited version. What was your purpose in being in the war? What was your job? I was a film cameraman for an American network. Uh, we'd film the day's actions. You know, we'd, we'd go looking for action. We'd be, we'd be sent out looking for action. So we'd march all day if need be to hear a shot fired. And uh, what were the physical conditions of, uh, of working in that country? Well, it was hard. I was a lot younger. And so you'd, you'd be able to march all day with a full pack and a camera and film and all this kind of stuff. Very hot? Oh, yes. Christ, it was, it, it, it was just hot. It, every day was hot. There was no hot or cool or anything. It was just plain hot. Mm -hmm. So it was your place to fire in action, put yourself in that position? 
And if you didn't find it, you'd, you'd go somewhere else to find it. Mm -hmm. What about the journalists coming in? Do you think they had a morbid fascination with war? Well, maybe so, but, but what is a morbid fascination in the, in the context of, of kind of being there and being paid to do it and having to go and look for it? Because that's what your, your job is all about in kind of retrospect, if you like, you know, sure it was a morbid fascination, but uh, you, you were more than an onlooker to the whole thing. You were, uh, you were involved in it as your, um, as your profession, as your livelihood, the same as the military. The military were involved in it to kill, so you were involved in it to film them killing. If you were put in a position where a colleague of yours was, was wounded, and you were filming, would you continue to film or would you go to the assistance of your, your friend, colleague? Well, it never happened to me. Um, and so it's, it's difficult for me to say what I would have done. I had, I had a sound man, an English guy, who was wounded, uh, but I wasn't with him at the time. And we were quite close. We would, we'd been uh, right through the whole war together. On this particular occasion, I was, I was somewhere else. Uh, but a story was told after I left of a couple of Singapore Chinese guys who were a crew with the outfit that I worked for. Uh, one was the cameraman and one was the sound man. Uh, and one of them was wounded in front of a North Vietnamese bunker a position. Uh, this is when the Vietnamese were, were running the war, not the Americans. And the, and the Vietnamese fell back and left of these wounded correspondents in the field. That's something the Americans would never do. That was, that was something else you had in the back of your mind. If you were working for the Americans, they'd, they'd look after you. If you were wounded, you'd be on a medical evacuation helicopter and you'd be on an operating table within, within 10 minutes or so. You, you were quite looked after, so you didn't have that in the back of your mind. When you were out on patrol, where did you position yourself? Well, <laughs> I, um, I took notice of all the advice I was given when I first turned up. And I listened to how other people had, had got themselves killed. So I used to position myself in the middle of the column, away from the heavy mortar, uh, from the heavy weapons platoon, and away from the headquarters platoon. I would be next to a couple of medics. As close as possible. Uh, just to be on the safe side. Mm -hmm. Do you think that uh, the correspondents, uh, that they came into the war late, the American correspondents, why? Well, obviously, towards at uh, the end of the 60s when the war was was becoming uh, the cause that it was uh, there were reputations to be made uh, professionally and so more and more Americans turned up when I first went there there were no American cameramen uh, with the network that I was with uh, nor were there any American sound men we were all Australians there were Germans there were French there were South Africans there were English it wasn't until later on in the 60s, towards uh, the end of the 60s, that the Americans started turning up. Mm -hmm. How are you going, Dave? Peter Layden, take five. How does the camaraderie differ between the boys down the pub at the mirror and, and the war zone? Well, it was different, you know. It was just plain different. You were closer, uh, you, you lived together, you were out, you know, getting shot at together. So it was, it was very much a closer situation. But I mean, can you really relate to those fellows down the pub at the Daily Mirror? Well, not really. Uh, they don't want to know about Vietnam. Uh, Vietnam was ten years ago, you know. Has it been hard for you to adjust coming back in your life? It was hard when I first came back. Uh, but you get used to it. You, uh, you get used to the fact that, that no one wants to talk about it. And if you didn't? If you didn't talk about it? Mm, if you didn't adjust to life, what was...? Well, if you didn't adjust to life, you, you just wouldn't exist, would you? They talked about mortgages, colour television sets and, and cars. How do you relate to that after Vietnam? Well, so you talk about mortgages, colour television sets and cars. Was it computer war? Well, it was very much so. You'd, um, you'd have your hot shower in the morning, your croissants and coffee, downstairs, catch a cab. Three blocks away, they'd be shooting up and down the street. They'd be dead lying in the street. After you'd film what you had to film, you were back in a taxi cab, back to your air-conditioned hotel room, your gin tonics, your lovely dinner of, of French food and the rooftop restaurants. Would journalists uh, spend up bigger when they were off work? Oh yeah, oh yeah, we all used to. They were, 
huge card games, $3,000 pots. Why did they spin up so big? Well, I think you just would in a situation like that. The, the, uh, the GIs did the same. Life was uh, so... Uh, Life was here today, gone tomorrow, if you like. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good.